Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX is brought to you by IG, the world leading online trading and investments provider. Welcome. You're listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded podcast with Daily FX. I'm your host, analyst and editor at Daily FX, Martin Essex. We bring you trading insights on the world's biggest market, the $5 trillion a day FX market, as well as commodities and other key assets while describing the opportunities that may be emerging around the world. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to this podcast. With me today is Dr. Mark Faber, a Swiss economist and market forecaster based in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Mark publishes the Gloom, Boom and Doom report and is the director of Mark Faber Limited, an investment advisor and fund manager. Mark is also a director, advisor and shareholder of a number of investment funds that focus on emerging and frontier markets. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, you're you're known as Dr. Doom and as a contrarian. Um, with many major markets, major stock markets, still not far from their record highs despite the coronavirus, does that mean that you're a, a bear? Well, it's uh, it's an unusual environment because, and we'll talk about this later on about technical analysis, because uh, through money printing, markets have been distorted. And I would say, in good English, if an individual would do what central banks have been doing, he would be in jail for market manipulations. <laughs> but yes. uh, central banks are kind of a official body, and they are, as you know, there are nowadays two legal systems, one for government officials and one for common thieves. And the common thieves, they go to jail and uh, people in high position, they kind of enjoy immunity. So the so, central banks have manipulated markets. And as a result of that, uh, you had in the 70s, the Dow Jones fluctuating between, I don't know, around 700 to 1000. And now we're over 26,000 on the way to probably 30,000 or so, and possibly much higher. But a lot of that is because of money printing, which in turn inflates corporate profits or has done so far and has driven up all asset prices, whether it's real estate, bonds, stocks, uh, art prices, collectibles, and so forth. So, uh, in other words, I think, I, if, I don't, if you don't mind me putting uh, words in your mouth, uh, we're in a bubble. Um, you're known for your many correct market calls, but do you now regret warning back a couple of years ago of a massive stock market decline, or do you think that's still to come? <laughs> well, I'm not the great believer in the song of no regrets. But, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, I'm now 74 years old. And if I look back, I could regret every year something I've done and uh, regret something I haven't done. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I think that's a uh, life of individuals that you go through a lifetime of errors <laughs> and trials and uh, occasionally you get something right and then you either make money or you can achieve a certain level of happiness without even having money. You know, that's the way of uh, the teachings of Buddha say you you should not aim at wealth, but you should well aim at uh, enlightenment. So there are different ways. And uh, as you look back on your life, you sometimes think, how stupid could I be? <laughs> and then you look also back and then you say to yourself, how lucky was I? that this didn't turn out as bad as I had expected or that I didn't have an accident. You know, I've been riding motorcycles since I'm 16 and uh, I never had a serious accident. I mean, once in a while the bike falls over, 
because I may have drunk too much. But <laughs> but I never had an accident, <laughs> so, or you fall over the road, and so you look back and you say to yourself, "Well, yes, I made mistakes and so forth, but I've also been bloody lucky, and uh, so that's life." So as long as uh, you make more money from the uh, uh, the trades that work um, than the you lose money from the ones that don't work, then you're fine. <laughs> well, my experience is uh, the best is actually to work a lot. And if you work a lot and uh, you are relatively productive, then you can achieve some uh, level of wealth. Even if you're a carpenter or if you're a builder or an electrician or whatever you do, but if you have to work hard for a given period of time. And initially, in the early years, I think and that uh, the millennial generation doesn't be believe so much, but I grew up in an environment where you had to save money. I mean, you know, you go to work and you get the salary of a thousand or five thousand, whatever it is. But the aim is to put every month, every month, some money aside and then invest that money. And some did it in real estate and I have friends. They don't understand anything. They just bought paintings and they made a lot of money out of the paintings. And others bought uh, the Dow Jones or stocks, and they did well, and so forth and so on. But I think it's uh, it's uh, in life you don't make that much money out of your investments unless you have a lucky strike, like uh, we had between 1980 and essentially today, where you have this colossal asset inflation. This is not typical of. Um, investment markets and of the world this is a very unusual period so if you ask me about 2017 and say do you regret that i'd say well i regret that throughout my life i didn't put all my money in the s p 500 and kept it there and never changed anything because in the long run it would have done fantastically well so if you're right and there is going to be at some time a big stock market decline um do you think that emerging and frontier stock markets provide better opportunities than the mainstream markets i'm thinking about wall street and london and tokyo and so on that is a very good question and uh, as you know we can measure value and growth and you define value as companies that are say selling below book value have a low price to sales ratio and so forth and so on and growth are companies like the fang and related stocks facebook amazon google's apple and so forth they are perceived as growth companies the way when I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, we had the concept of Nifty 50 and the quality growth stocks, including Kodak, Polaroid, uh, Xerox, Boros, Digital, uh, IBM, Sears, JC Penney, uh, Kresge. Of all these companies, most are out of business. <laughs> and so the concept of growth changes over time and uh, there are different styles of investment. Warren Buffett leads more towards a value investor. And Benjamin Graham, he wrote a book about that. And other investors are growth investors and growth investors tend to do very well during bubble stages. But in the very long run, 30, 40 years, uh, value tends to outperform growth. But there are periods during which growth outperforms value. And we've been in a period of extreme 
outperformance of growth over value. So to answer your question about emerging markets and frontier, they are better value than the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100, undoubtedly. But it doesn't just occur that if the S&P and the NASDAQ drops by 50%, that all these other markets will go up. Uh, they will be dragged down as well initially. And then after a while, they will start to outperform and massively outperform on the upside. So as an investor, uh, you should be diversified and I would have some of my assets in emerging uh, markets and frontier. I happen to have most of my positions in emerging markets, most. These are your um, positive bets, presumably. Well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'd say these are the bets that I think I can uh, survive a bear market with reasonably well because the stocks are already depressed. So maybe they will fall down less than the glamour stocks. I'd like to remind you that stocks like uh, Memorex, Polaroid, Kodak, and so forth, in, in the 73, 74 bear market, they all dropped by 70%. And let me remind you closer to our time, after the NASDAQ bubble in the year 2000, all these stocks, including the best like Amazon, they also fell 70, 80%. Yes, no wonder your report is called Gloom, Boom and Doom. Um, <laughs> um, it aims to warn investors, doesn't it, that when investment themes have become widely accepted and assets are therefore highly priced and risky, which fall into that category at the moment? Which assets are highly priced and risky? <laughs> well, most assets are highly priced, uh, risky. You know, this risk... Uh, is a very difficult uh, concept to define. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, Argentina issued 100-year bonds with a coupon of 6.5%, which was a very high coupon at the time, and the issue was oversubscribed, and now these bonds are worth, I don't know, about half as much as when they were issued. In other words, they're trading probably around the 50 or so. In the same year, Austria issued 100-year bonds with a coupon of 2, 1 quarter percent. And uh, not many people were interested because they said the coupon is so low. Well, these Austrian bonds because of the zero interest rates or below zero interest rates policy of the ECB, they went up to 200. Uh, so you understand the concept of risk uh, is very difficult to define. So in everybody other words, thinks, the, lesson uh, for everybody says, the, Mark, the lesson for investors is that don't just look at the income, look at the capital as well. Yes, and also... Uh, look at the unusual possibilities. I mean, I gave money to a money manager about 20 years ago with the mandate to invest in fixed interest securities in Switzerland and mostly the euro area in quality bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I was uh, of the opinion that over time interest rates would still come down I didn't think they would go to below zero. But anyway, th th we have to talk about this in a second. But I thought interest rates would go down. Well, this fund manager uh, performed extremely poorly because he never extended the maturity of the portfolio. Because when Swiss franc bonds were yielding 2 3%, he said to himself, they're far too expensive, so I'm not going to buy them. But you understand, now these bonds that were yielding then 2 
they have a minus yield. They are negative yielding bonds. Uh, you have in Switzerland a bond that is a 10 years bond. I can give you precisely the details. And this 10 year bond has a zero coupon, in other words, zero interest. And it trades now at 113.3. In other words, the investor, he pays today for a Swiss franc bond 113. He's guaranteed to get back 100 in 10 years time. But he has no interest on these bonds. These are zero coupon bonds. So he's guaranteed to lose 13 over 10 years time. Now, everybody says, this guy who buys his bonds, he must be crazy. Yeah, the gods are crazy. In our case, the central bankers are crazy. But this is what is happening now in the market. Now, I can give you two scenarios under which this bond would be very good. If the Swiss franc goes up dramatically against the US dollar, then these bonds are actually quite desirable. Number two, if someone like a super bear, <laughs> like say Dr. Doom, Faber, alias Faber, thinks that everything will collapse by 70%, and here he has an investment that will only lose 13% over 10 years, well, I think it's a bargain. <laughs> you, so you understand? Did you, um, you, did, really you sack, did you sack that fund manager? Yes, actually I did, because I said to him, yes, you had some investment restrictions that were limiting you to invest in bonds, but you achieved a return of, say, not even 1% per annum. And I think if you had just bought a few bonds with a maturity of 10 years, you could have boosted that return to, say, 3-4%. I didn't expect him to make 20% per annum, but say around four, three, four, five percent should be expected. Nowadays, three, four percent is a very high yield because, as you know, uh, on cash, you get the mostly negative returns. And the 10 year treasury in the US in dollars yields 1.57% 10 years. Uh, surprisingly, in Greece, it yields 1.14%. Can you believe that? In Spain, 0.26%. Uh, in Portugal, 03 And in Italy, 0.9%. So here you have it. Uh, the treasuries are used, yielding much more than these European government bonds. Most of which are are semi bankrupt. <laughs> yes. So you, well, you probably search the for... US is also bankrupt, but <laughs> so when you ask me about value, you know, it's very difficult to really find true value. So let's let's move on then. So you search for opportunities in what you call unloved and depressed markets. Give me some examples of these. Well, uh, I'd say that if you are a trader, and if you are good at it, the agricultural commodities are very depressed. That is one sector that is extremely depressed. Uh, another sector that I'd say is very depressed, but is very tedious work. In Europe, you have high prices in the capitals, like you know, Frankfurt, these are financial centers, and Munich, and Paris, and Lyon, and London, and Edinburgh, and so forth, and now even Dublin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the countryside, especially in Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, you can find properties dirt cheap, dirt cheap also in Eastern Europe and in the Balkan countries. So there are opportunities in real estate. 
And I'm saying this because I believe now we have this coronavirus. I may add it's still safe to drink Corona beer, but <laughs> the virus is the reality. So what yeah. was the reaction around the world and especially in China? It said people should stay home. I think it's a very interesting thing that this is happening because I don't see any reason nowadays for people to go every day to an office. The only reason I might see there is that uh, women want to get rid of their husbands during the day or husbands want to leave their wives during the day. But otherwise, it would be much more economical since we have instant communication. I talk to you now on the phone. We have a conference call and we live on different continents. Uh, it's much more convenient to do your work at home. Then you don't waste your time traveling to the office and being stressed out when you arrive because the traffic was jammed or the trains were late and so forth and so on. And you just go to your office once a week. It would save a lot of money to the corporations. They don't have to rent expensive space anymore and so forth and so on. So, so you understand, I believe that in future, many jobs can be outsourced to different locations than the city centers. That was different 50 years ago. You know, if you were involved in the stock market, you had to be in a city because the scripts had to be shipped back and forth between different offices. Now all this is electronic. So real estate outside the cities in the countryside. Yes. And I mean, in Italy, okay, let's change track. In Spain, the, you see what has happened because there are no opportunities. So there were no opportunities in small villages. Uh, there has been depopulation. A lot of small villages, I see it also in Switzerland, in the mountains, they've been abandoned. And you get the real estate there from the government, essentially free of charge. You commit yourself to do something with it and to rebuild it. But uh, I think that when people say, well, we don't have any opportunities and we can't uh, invest our money, uh, we, we don't have enough money to buy a property in the main cities, I'd say outside the cities, there are opportunities for people who don't have a, a very significant asset base. Okay. Um, let's turn to Asia as you're there. Um, in your book, Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age of Discovery, you wrote about investment opportunities specifically in Asia. Yes. Are there still are there still many or uh, have we all missed the boat now if we haven't if we're not already in Asia? Well, it's funny. I was recently at the birthday of a friend of mine. He's 90 and he's been very successful. He's not in the financial sector, by the way. He's another thief. He's in a, he was running trading companies. And uh, he's made a lot of money. He's very smart, very hard working. And then someone asked him at his birthday uh, if you came to a, he came to Asia, I think in the late fifties or early sixties. And so they asked him again, "Well, if you were today twenty years old, would you again go to Asia?" He said, yeah, for sure, there's plenty of opportunities, but the opportunities are different than they were when I went there in the 60s. I went to Hong Kong. I first worked three years in New York, 1970 to 73, and then I went to Hong Kong and developed our business throughout Asia. So I've seen Asia early on, and the initial opportunities were in Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, but then the opportunities shifted to countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and later China. 
and India. And so there are always new countries coming up. And the there's never a lack of opportunities. The problem in investing in some of these markets is more a legal problem and an execution risk. You know, you come across people, uh, they may appear to you to be honest and they have a project in either Vietnam or Bangladesh or Cambodia or somewhere and you invest with them and then they either lose interest or they then pursue their own businesses and they neglect the joint the business that they have with you and so forth. You know, there's lots of things that can happen that then adversely impact your investments. So there I see a difficulty. But in terms of opportunities, when I came to Asia, we didn't know mobile phones. We didn't know fax machines. You know, and this whole thing uh, has opened up a new world. You look at the most successful companies today, most of them went public uh, after the 90s and or after 2000. Facebook went public, of, I think, in 2004 or something like this. Uh, so the world is continuously changing and there will always be opportunities. And actually, I think today, in Asia, there are far more opportunities than they were when I went there in 73. But it's also more competitive because in 73, when I came to Asia, I had a doctor degree in economics. I was somebody relatively special. Nowadays, you have thousands of people who have doctor degrees in economics who come from China, they come from India, from all over. So there's more competition than there was when I arrived. And Asians don't need us as much as they used to need us at the time. Okay. With me today is Dr. Mark Faber, who is the publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom report. Um, back in a few moments, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Faber about um, the central banks. Visit IG.com and choose from more than 80 Forex pairs. Discover low spreads, intuitive platforms and round-the-clock customer care at IG.com today. Uh, Dr. Faber, you've, we were talking earlier about the central banks and yes. you've criticised the Federal Reserve robustly, I think is the right word, and said, the US, and, and said the US economy is doomed this year. What is it that the Fed has done wrong? Well, I think that uh, if you follow the classical economic theories, uh, then you know that with money printing, you can postpone problems. It's like if your building has cracks, you can put fresh paint on top of these cracks and the building then looks sound, but uh, the cracks are still there. And if you don't repair the cracks or the structure of the building, one day the whole thing will collapse, maybe the day after you repainted it. And I think this is the danger with the view that you can eliminate the business cycle by printing money. And uh, we have different times in history when uh, people engaged in money printing. The first well-documented case was actually uh, close to uh, London and Paris, John Law. And uh, the people that essentially developed the South Sea Company in London. And as I said, John Law with the Mississippi scheme in Paris. And they thought that money printing could bail them out, but it didn't work. And so it's actually interesting that it, this experiment has been repeated and that uh, central bankers who are mostly, I'd say, 99% are people who are academics and 
they must have read about financial history or had courses about economic history and they should be familiar with the inflation in Rome and in Greece in the antiquity and then uh, the John Law saga and the hyperinflation in France and the Weimar hyperinflation and so forth. So I'm actually surprised that they're engaging in this money printing. But my view is that the government, the Treasury Department, in other words, the people that look after fiscal policy, taxes and expenditures, and uh, the central banks is one and the same. They are all the same and they work together. Uh, is a pipe dream to think that central banks nowadays are independent. They are controlled by politicians or vice versa. They control the politicians. But basically it's one and the same vicious animal uh, which some people call the deep state. And uh, I think uh, that one of the very negative consequences of the current very high inflation in asset prices is that it has increased the wealth and income inequality very substantially. The consequence of which is that uh, the left-wing parties that want to redistribute the wealth, they have been gaining a lot of power. Now, as you know, in England, uh, Boris Johnson was elected. But basically, I think that this is a temporary thing that in the long run, the left-wing parties will become stronger and that some of the wealth accumulation we experienced in the last, uh, say, 20, 30 years, that some of it will be taxed away or maybe even taken away entirely. So if you're right and asset prices are overinflated and we're in a kind of modern equivalent of the South Sea bubble, what can investors do to protect themselves? Well, first of all, I would have said this already five years ago, and I know people who already said it in the 1980s. Very respectable strategies at Merrill Lynch, by the way. So we don't know how long it will last. It can last uh, much longer. It could last another two years. It could last another five or maybe even ten years. But anyway, I think in absence of knowing the outcomes. I mean, how do you know who will win the election in the US in the fall? <coughs> I happen to believe that Trump has a very good chance, but it's not guaranteed. So we don't know much about the future. We also don't know much about the coronavirus and then, then, then maybe other viruses that will come up or will have been developed by some evil person a la uh, James Bond movie. Anyway, <laughs> in absence of knowing all these things, you want to be diversified. So depending on, your, on the sizes of your assets, this diversification is easier or more difficult. I mean, someone who has a billion dollars, it's relatively easy for him to invest say, half his money outside where he lives. So he could live in wherever, uh, from Monaco to San Marino to Liechtenstein or Switzerland or wherever, or London, and have his money in the US and in Asia and so forth. Uh, and someone who is a small saver, he can't do that. But he can buy some funds that invest internationally and as a very general rule, I would say this is now not uh, a genius investment strategy, but one that uh, I think will protect you. You put 25% of your assets in real estate and about 25% in equities. 
25% in bonds and 25% in precious metals. Yes, you've been very bullish on gold, haven't you? And, and indeed other precious metals. Are you still bullish on gold? Yes, I, but you understand, I don't want to say I'm very bullish about gold and then someone goes out and puts all his money into gold because that's not the idea. No, I you have, said the idea is to diversify. Yes, I have a large position relative to other people in gold, but I know some of the really true believers <laughs> in gold they have everything in gold and gold shares and silver and platinum and palladium. You understand? Hmm. These are the true believers. They have everything in precious metals and they develop themselves mines. And I am uh, of the view that there are times when gold performs very well. By the way, between 99 and today, gold has uh, performed as well as the S&P with dividends reinvested. So it's actually performed very well. And since 2015, in 2015, we were around 1,000 for gold, and now we are around 1,500. So it's also performed very well. Uh, so I think that the idea of being in precious metals is correct. Is the time the best to buy today or should you wait a few days or should you buy in a few months? I don't know. I buy every month uh, with some of my savings gold and uh, occasionally I buy a larger position when I feel that the gold price has become near term oversold. Currently, it is not oversold. Currently, compared to gold, silver and platinum are very inexpensive. So I wrote a, a piece, a theoretical piece, you know, about an uncle of mine who only invests every 10 years all his money in one asset that is depressed. For the next year, 10 years, I selected at Christmas 2019, in other words, a month ago, I selected uh, platinum for the next 10 years because platinum tends to sell at the premium against gold, but now it is at a huge discount. Okay, turning to foreign exchanges, um, which currencies do you see as currently overpriced and which is <laughs> underpriced? Well, that is again the concept of what is overpriced and what is underpriced. Right now, every currency is priced the way the market determines the currency. But my view would be, and this is a personal view, I think the euro is relatively cheap compared to the US dollar. I think uh, the US dollar is relatively expensive compared to the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, and about just about any currency. You understand? I, my belief is Trump and the US is very good and at exaggerating and at bullshitting. And uh, the position of the U.S. economy is not that much better than it is in Europe. In fact, I would argue that in Europe, because we had already widespread socialism in many countries, uh, very embedded like France and so forth, there is a move more towards the right. And in America, I believe that at latest in 2024, the left wing, uh, the more radical 
wing of the Democratic Party will have a representation in government. And then there will be a big shift towards the left, because in America, the wealth inequality is much more pronounced than it is in Europe. So I think the euro, uh, from my perspective, has been talked down and is, uh, you know, when markets bottom out, everything looks bad. And when markets peak out, everything looks uh, great. I think in America, things look better than they really are. And in Europe, they look worse than they really are. And uh, let me remind you, last year, many European stocks performed superbly. I want to ask you one more question, and that's about technical analysis. Um, you're not a great fan. What, why not? Uh, actually, when I started to work, I belonged to the Technical Analyst Society in America, and I've been giving speeches uh, about technical analysis. I mean, I've, I've known all the great technicians from Joe Granville to Alan Shaw to Bob Farrell and uh, uh, Bob Prechter is of the Elliott Wave. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, many others like Arch Crawford. And I correspond with all of them. I can hear and a but coming up. I beg your pardon? I can hear a but coming up. Yeah. <laughs> no. And so uh, I like charts and I have all the books on technical analysis, the first editions and so forth. And I studied also the GAN figures and everything. In general, I would not buy any stock or anything without looking at the charts. That's why I have a Bloomberg traveler. Before I do anything, I always look at the chart. But I would not necessarily buy something only because of the chart. You understand? That's the difference. I would like to buy something that is very depressed, that is neglected, or where all the analysts are negative, but where the charts uh, show a bottom formation, ideally a few years saucer bottom formation. In other words, an asset that went down for many years is in the bottoming process. This bottoming process can take sometimes five years, sometimes 10 years. You know, the precious metals they peaked out in 1980 and then they went down and then they formed the bottom for maybe 15 years between the mid 80s and uh, 1999. But when they broke out on the upside in 99, 2000, it was a very powerful technical signal, very powerful. And so, at the time, I said to myself, never before have precious metals been as low as they were in 2000. And uh, at the same time, you have great looking charts on precious metals. So I thought this is a lifetime buying opportunity. And the result? Well, as you know, the result has been very good. Precious metals uh, outperformed dramatically until 2011. Gold went from less than 300 to $1,921. So that was a very good investment. And I still think that gold, silver, platinum uh, are nowadays actually cheaper then they were in year 99, considering all the money printing that has occurred and by how much the Dow Jones has increased in value. 
Thank you very much. That's all very interesting. I'm going to ask you one concluding question, Mark. Um, I understand you were in the Swiss national ski team. Is that right? Yes, uh, but I never went to any Olympics. And I skied mostly on the university level. But I went to a few World Cup races, not very successfully, but anyway, <laughs> it, in life is more important to participate than to win, as you know. Mark Faber, it's been good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast. This podcast is brought to you by IG. Check us out at dailyfx.com. If you love the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Thank you.